to our first in-person SmartCon. Um, it's absolutely incredible to have met so many of you here for the first time in real life. And that's why we actually put this together, because many of these colleagues of mine I've actually never met in real life. And so you can think of this panel as a proof of life. <laughs> we exist. <laughs> we are here. Uh, sometimes you may not see us all the time publicly speaking and at events, but that's because we're behind the scenes building. And at Chainlink, if you've been here and part of the community, you know that at Chainlink, we build and we get stuff done. So that's why we're, you know, you don't see us all the time, but we did want to give you a chance to meet the folks behind the scenes and get to know some of these amazing colleagues of mine. So with that, I would love to, maybe if you guys can just introduce yourselves, you know, your name, your title, so some folks might not know you yet, and then we'll dive into future questions. So, Dahlia. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Dahlia Malki. I'm Chief Research Officer I think the sound's Clubs. a little low. That's nothing I can do about it. Hi, uh, I'm Kamal, Chief Product Officer at Chainlink Labs. Hi, I'm Mike Derrison, COO at Chainlink Labs. Hi, I'm Steve Ellis, uh, Chief Technology Officer at Chainlink Labs. All right, well, you have their names, but I'd like to dive in a little bit more. You guys, some of you have joined us recently in the last few months, and some of you uh, have been here since the very beginning. So maybe we'll start with Steve. You know, you've been here since the very beginning. How, you know, maybe tell a little bit about the founding story of Chainlink and how you even got into Web3 and came up with the idea. Sure, yeah. Uh, I've always been, I think the, the idea of a, a distributed ledger was always very powerful to me when, once I started to, to grasp that beyond monetary purposes. I think a um, like common problem in history is that like, the winner gets to rewrite history. And so the idea that there's sort of this, this immutable record seemed extremely powerful. This, this something that never existed. So was excited to dive into that. Uh, and then pretty early on, we, we recognized that oracles were going to be extremely powerful. So we decided to focus on that. Uh, there was sort of first version. We were an oracle providing it. And it doesn't take too much feedback to recognize that you know, in a distributed system, you, you want many different. If it's, all, if it's purely decentralized, uh, you, why, why would you trust a centralized oracle? So we ran, then we, did, we had an open source implementation that anybody could run, but it was, we pretty quickly saw the problem of, I, you don't want your counterparty to run an oracle, uh, you don't, because you, you don't necessarily trust them, you, you don't want yourself to necessarily run an oracle, so we wanted to find a, an incentive, uh, how do you find, uh, how do you incentivize unbiased third party oracles to, to provide secure data? And that was, that was how we landed on Chainlink. Wow, and that was now six, seven years ago? Uh, Chainlink 2017, wow. but I think uh, 2014 is when I wow. officially started working with, with Sergey. Very cool. Wow, and then in the last few, you know, year and months, we've had a few other amazing new people join. Mike, you know, share, I mean, you came from a decade plus at LinkedIn to join the yeah. space. Yeah. So. Yeah, so uh, I've been here now almost about a year, and uh, what happened about a year ago was I just got hooked on Web3, and I just had that light bulb moment that many of us in this room probably have, where you start to see, wow, this makes sense, uh, to have cryptographic guarantees, to have a more deterministic world than a probabilistic world, and uh, I just felt like this was uh, something that was just getting going in a really meaningful way. And also, for me, it was a bit of an interesting journey, because I started my career back, believe it or not, in the mid-'90s at an internet company in Web1 uh, that was around <laughs> data, uh, and it was emerging market data. And I, I remember at the time in the, the late-'90s, like, I, how lucky am I? Like, the, this, this moment of the, like, the birth, really, of the internet. And uh, as I dug more and more into Web3, like, wow, it's happening again? I, how lucky to have a second uh, shot at it. And then, of course, in the middle, I was in Web 2, where I was uh, at LinkedIn for a decade. We forgave you for the Web 2. <laughs> and Kamal, similarly, you were also from Web 2 and yes. to the side. Yeah, I think uh, for me, the notion that um, you could build an app that can't be shut down, I think this notion is just so powerful. Like, if you, if you believe in sort of the power of the builder and, and, and their, their power to change things, and the fact that now builders can create things that can't be shut down, that, that's such a powerful idea. But I've always sort of known that I was, I was going to do something in the space. 
Um, I, oh, so I've been watching the space uh, for quite some time, and, and I felt uh, probably last year that things were really accelerating, um, that the community was coming together, that the building blocks were starting to, were starting to, to be in place. And so I thought, okay, that's probably the, the moment to jump in. I, I think that I love working on transformative technologies. I had the privilege to, um, to lead the TensorFlow team at Google. TensorFlow is the, mo the number one machine learning framework in the world. And, and I feel that like, you know, all together, you know, we can really uh, provide so much change in, in, in the industry and society with, again, like this premise of apps that can't be shut down and that, that are provably fair. Mm -hmm. cool. And you, Dahlia, too. So for me, uh, it's sort of uh, different what I'm excited about now and what got me first. Now, with slightly more uh, insight, the main thing that excites me about the field is uh, inclusion, financial inclusion, inclusion of pirates, private sector, allowing uh, initiative and entrepreneurship, uh, not just at the periphery of the financial system, but really deep down into the foundations. And financial system, uh, I refer to as, you know, the more general, uh, uh, you know, uh, plat what platforms uh, allow. This is really what drives all of the use cases and applications on top of it. But this is an insight that I came to a little uh, later uh, in the process, I have to admit. So I started uh, my interest in the field mostly in the technology. The technology was uh, in the field of expertise that I was already in, and I thought it was fascinating. And uh, the thing that drew me the most was an article in 2017 by Mark Adriessen, where he said, Bitcoin solved the Byzantine general's problem. I was like, wow, really? That's interesting. I'm not sure Bitcoin did. Let, let me look into this a little deeper. And together with other experts in the field, you know, we did a lot of work to bring the technologies from the academic world and the rigorous foundations uh, closer uh, and, and bridge this uh, understanding between uh, what's happening technically in the Web3 space uh, compared with what the, the uh, academic and uh, scientific uh, community uh, knew about. Yeah. Yeah, many of us all came from the Web2 space, but we found that Web3 is where all the action's at, where the future's at, where the inclusion and where we all wanted to be. But within Web3, though, there's lots of different projects and protocols and things like that. So maybe starting from this side, Dahlia, how did you decide Chainlink? Um, well, it's the only project that put me through a rigorous, uh, uh, you know, screening <laughs> process. But no, they, they, they might think really well of themselves if they're putting me through such a rigorous screening process. Uh, but going back to the technical side, um, I think that uh, um, the real challenge for industry right now is beyond consensus. And I say this as a consensus expert. There's always got to be ways to improve layer one chains and do more performance, throughput, this, that. But really the challenge is uh, to bridge between what blockchains cannot do. And let's face it, smart contracts, as much as Kamal likes them, uh, are very, very, very limited in what they do. Did, did you, uh, uh, you know, ever program in assembly language, you know, uh, an AD86 uh, of course. Uh, processor? Yes, you did. <laughs> well, that, that would have been a better experience than programming smart contracts today. Uh, so I think that the real challenge our industry faces is really beyond consensus, is bringing capabilities and bridges cross chains and to the world and to the real world into smart contracts, uh, and that's why I joined Chainlink. But really because of the interview process. <laughs> no, it's really we because of the interview process. process. Yeah, they, they grilled me. No, no. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and Kamal, what about you? Yeah, uh, so I, I agree. Uh, I have not coded in assembly uh, yesterday, or nor for a long time, <laughs> but I agree that uh, I think right now, the biggest hurdle I could see for uh, massive adoption, I'm talking about like, 10x, 100x, 1,000x more developers and more application is the ability to bridge all these different pieces together, uh, assets, smart contracts, Web2 data, Web2 resources, and provide composability. I mean, in Web2, this is really how ecosystem take off. When you could take the best component to do something and you don't you know, know, you just know the API for that thing, you just compose it. Um, and, and I think Chainlink solves this problem. Um, so th that's first reason. Um, second reason is I, I love working on developer platforms. 
Um, I think there's something magical about taking something that's very complex, very hard, and only some very, very smart people can figure out. And you're um, looking at me because... Uh, yes, uh, and, uh, and, and I'm looking this way as well. Uh, <laughs> and I'm looking at you too. <laughs> but um, but and, and, and just wrapping it up in an API that's easy to use, some magical things happen because developer communities, they go do incredible things that you would never have imagined uh, when you were actually designing this API. And yeah. that's, that's magic. And I, I'm addicted to this, so that's, that's why I joined. That's good. Yeah, for me, I'd say it was probably two things. Uh, I'd say one is vision and two is variety. So the vision at Chainlink is essentially Chainlink Labs is to build a world powered by truth. And you, know, you think about how many things are uh, not going well in the world, and a lot of it's due to disinformation, misinformation. And so this whole set of proving all of this, these things that happen in the real world um, is something very meaningful and something that I wanted to be a part to help shape. So that was probably the, the biggest thing. I'd say the second thing is um, I'm a generalist by nature. I just love variety of things. And just where Chainlink's position, you know, we help enable so many different applications. And so the conversations, the things to think through uh, are very, very uh, diverse and wide. And uh, I, I just love that. And so it's a very unique spot uh, where we are in the, the landscape. Mm -hmm. Steve, uh, yep. you want to answer? Or? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, yeah, I think a little bit more on, on what we're doing. Just I, this is one of the biggest problems. As a smart contract developer, when I started to get involved, how we saw Oracle problem as a problem is just that there are so many limitations, and how do, we, how do we help deliver blockchain and make it what everybody thinks? This was just a big missing piece of the system that we wanted to focus on and thought, this is how we can make the most impact and help the whole ecosystem yeah. grow the most. This question um, is a bit more for Mike Kamal Udalia, since you spent a long time at the large tech companies, right? I'm really curious, you know, from more of an operator perspective, how has you know operating in this Web three space been different than operating back the large techs? Come on. Uh, I think the the decentralized nature of things is both uh, sometimes as an operator it's like surprising, but it's also exhilarating because. I mean, really what you want to do with a community is uh, unlock it, un unleash it, enable it, or pick your fancy term. But really, you want to just give them the tool and see them run with it. And I think the decentralized nature of things, you really have to just accept and let go and be like, you know, we're just going to put these things in, and all those things are going to happen. So I think for me, this has been uh, one of the um, you know, really interesting learnings. And I'm obviously I'm, I'm, I'm still learning and would love to meet, you know, uh, all of you and learn from where you, your use cases and how we can uh, work together. So, but I, I think this is really where the world's going. Um, you know, we're going from like small team who are like who are like centralizing uh, ideas or or, or certain um, access or privilege to actually really decentralizing and providing. Getting back to to your point of global accessibility, right? I think there's we're lucky also to to work in an industry which North Star, again, another marketing term, sorry, <laughs> but uh, it is you know, providing banking services for the unbanked. I think it's really nice to know that this is something that we're all enabling. Yeah, I, I think for me, it's probably common for most startups, is just the sense of urgency is, is, is much different, right? You're, you're not living necessarily, of course, you have longer term strategies and visions, but most of your time is spent, okay, how do we get something done like quickly? Um, we, I think we're all in this room, we all sense there's something we're all building here that's gonna be historic. And you, know, you don't wanna waste those moments. And so uh, you know, what I've experienced at Chainlink Labs, which is just awesome, and I, I imagine many of, of uh, your startups and your companies that are in this, is a sense of urgency. Um, also, I'd say ownership. Uh, you know, just in a smaller company, you tend to have more ownership where there's just a lot less layers, a lot less things going, uh, matrix, and so you can actually get in there and, and actually start making things happen and, uh, and, and moving quicker. So I've, I've really enjoyed that part of it. What about you, Dahlia? Well, they kind of stole everything <laughs> that I want to say. Uh, so let me just double click on size and spe speed. Um, before I joined Chainlink, 
I thought, you know, looking at the technology that Chainlink has out there, that it must be a 10,000 people company, uh, 10,000 engineering company, uh, not counting overhead like me and you know, the guys here. Um, it's just staggering to see um, how much a small team, like the one we have at Chainlink, but we're also, you know, uh, all the other uh, ecosystem and community uh, projects out there. It's just staggering to see how quickly uh, and how much we achieve. Even looking at this event, like I've experienced such events at previous companies that I worked with uh, in like Microsoft. Uh, this is a phenomenal achievement. Look at this community. Look at how many you know, uh, interesting presentations there are. Just look at the size of this event. Would you have imagined that a few you know, a couple of hundred of engineers have brought this to happen. Yeah. It's just, yeah. And you guys all do have tons of experience from Web2. What kind of advice would you give, actually, for people now building in Web3? Like, what, should, what can we learn from you guys from that experience to help us make Web3 move forward faster? <laughs> Document? <laughs> Like, start with a design document, write it really well. It doesn't have to be 20 pages. It could be a one-pager document. But write it, share it with your team, go through some internal review, auditing, discuss it, maybe present it before you rush and build. Yeah, I would say, I think, um, I'm, I'm gonna answer your question in a slightly different way. Yeah. Um, I think we've been talking a lot about, you know, how do you start uh, with smart contracts? and how do you augment them? And I think uh, the next evolution is going to be uh, thinking about a Web3 app more generally and, and thinking that, okay, some piece of it, it's okay for it to be uh, on sitting on, on, on a server because it's more efficient at doing something uh, or it's accessing some kind of data that's not on chain yet. And some pieces absolutely need to be on chain and on chain A, then on chain B. And I think this, this, this idea of composability uh, is going to be even more important, and we're seeing this in all the modern modern Web3 apps, right? Uh, and obviously, like we're building the services to help you connect it all. But um, and and maybe that that that's even more important to have a design, an architecture in mind when when you do that. So um, for me, I, I think we're uh, I'm, I'm both very excited to to have seen all the birth and all this activity around like uh, exploring all these different direction. But now I feel that. The next evolution is to start thinking of like a, a, a holistic Web3 app and, uh, and think of, of trust minimization and decentralization as a spectrum, that it's okay to start with on a certain place on the spectrum and then go increasingly um, more decentralized as you know, chains get more capabilities. Yeah, I love that you're, we've talked about that, about the spectrum, and I, I think that's absolutely right. You know, you're gonna have a lot of these hybrids where they have some components that are trust minimized. Um, you know, I think one of the things we can learn from Web2 is scale. Uh, you know, some, some of the, the, the obviously the, the largest, most well-known tech companies have scaled massively. And actually, it's a balance, because I was just talking a few minutes ago about the sense of urgency, right, that you need. Um, but if you're urgent and just constantly putting out fires, you're also going to go in circles, right? So there's this, this tug that at certain moments, you actually have to slow down and go, okay, wait a minute, where's where this going to net out? Um, but you, don't, you can't do too much of that or you're going to miss your moment. So I think, um, you know, finding that right balance is most critical to, uh, to operate and then eventually get to scale. Yeah. Yeah, I like the, the point about slowing down. I mean, we definitely move quickly, but sometimes it, uh, you know, security is a big problem in the space. And so a thing that I, I saw more often before, but it, we're, we're changing is there's not, people don't always like go through writing tests. I think there's not, there's a, there's a rush to get out there. And obviously there's more and more hacks, more and more stuff like that. And so I think we need to really focus on security because if we want this to be sort of the long term, um, it, it's, you know, people treat it like a, like a sprint, it's more of a marathon, and we really need to invest in the long term in terms of test security, um, because there's a lot of excitement. But uh, and it's hard, I think, uh, to incentivize that. Uh, so it, it's a little bit on the community to push back if, if you don't see good practices there. So I'd, I'd recommend trying to do yeah. that. I mean, it's not easy, right? Here we're trying to move really fast because the space is moving fast. I mean, it's like if you take a week-long vacation, you come back, and there's like. 50 new protocols and the world's changed. Like Web3 just, it's, every day is different. 
but at the same time, right, we, it's immutable, so we can't just push if you make a mistake and you know, there's a hack and you know, the, then your whole protocol can go kerplunk. And so I think that's one of the challenges that you know, we here have to work and operate under. It's like how do we move fast and scale, but at the same time make sure that products that we put out there can be reliable and secure and trusted by all of our users. So, Move fast and secure things. Move, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not move yeah, not fast break, and break, not break things. things. No break, no break, break in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're building mission critical yeah, things, right? Yeah. Like if your like button doesn't work, yeah. it's fine. But if you know something goes down here, it's your billions of dollars under you know of assets under um, uh, total value locked and secured. You know that can all go down. So yeah. this is no back challenge. button. <laughs> exactly, no backplay. Um, and then, so you guys, we mentioned, you know, a few of you mentioned about like, hey, what this industry needs. I'm curious to maybe dive in a bit more. Like, Dolly, what, do you, what else do you think the industry needs to move forward to get to, you know, the promised land that we all here see? I've, you know, I presented earlier today. Uh, Wait, and I, I think I know what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> we work we say, so close together, we can read each other's yeah, minds. Shall we say one word each then? <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> let's try, yeah, let's try that. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> let's try to guess what the other person is going to say. I think Dolly's going to say Deco. <laughs> yeah, we need Deco. Uh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I really think that as a community, one of the biggest problems that we still need to solve is the privacy-preserving identity problem. Without, and I, and I would expand even more, uh, uh, privacy-preserving, you know, privacy-enhancing identity, but also bridging to compliance, to regulation, and to the Web2 world. And the reason is no financial platform, no financial foundations can really scale and uh, reach massive uh, um, use and adoption without solving this problem. And until we solve this problem, um, we will be, uh, you know, this, this esoteric uh, 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 industry, which uh, is extremely exciting, but it's exciting to, what, 50 million people uh, uh, who really take their chances or take the risks or, uh, you know, think that they, they know what they're doing. We have to address this problem. We have to be able to bring, I don't know, your, your aunt or your neighbor or your grandmother, we have to be able to bring them to uh, enjoy the benefits of uh, this uh, technology and uh, to bring everybody along with us to the right. And in order to do that, uh, we have to solve the financial identity and credentials uh, problem without compromising privacy. Yeah. Don't want everyone knowing, right. you know, what, you know, what you're what purchasing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, Dahlia, what is? That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I agree. I agree. I think this is uh, one of the big problems to solve. Um, I, so can I guess what you're yeah, going go to ahead. say? <laughs> Usability. Usability is a good guess. Okay, I'm going to go with usability then. <laughs> <laughs> Things have to be usable. <laughs> Uh, I was actually, actually going to go back to the, the connectivity piece. I think we need to, as we're thinking of, um, uh, of designing those, um, uh, those Web3 apps, we really have to make sure that um, when you're thinking, okay, I have this bit on Web2 and I have this bit on this chain and this bit on this other chain, that the connectivity piece is really working well and that the, uh, the API for the developer is really usable. So you did guess right. <laughs> API? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know. Wait, well, how come nobody's. Oh, oh you want to. Steve, we're you gonna, have to outguess Mike. Steve, you have so, to. Guess well, what is Mike about to say? Oh, well, oh you're, you're, you're going to guess. Um, I mean. uh, <laughs> bridges? <laughs> <laughs> Close. Actually, I'll, all right, I'll go with Bridges now. Um, no, I mean, I, I just uh, I'm excited, like many of us here, for, for use cases that just hit the masses, right? So, where this just becomes something uh, that many of, most of us in the world start to use. So, you know, I'm inspired by, um, I don't know if you heard the talk of, with Lemonade, for example, like that's a use case. Uh, you know, I think they had billions of farmers, many of them subsistence farmers. Um, how do you get them crop insurance? And blockchain's a great way to do that. 
because the way you can do that through, through reducing cost now makes it possible. And um, you know, is that one gonna hit? Hopefully, but um, we'll see. There's a lot of shots on goal now, and who knows, maybe it's like a silly app uh, that just captures the world. Maybe it's a game. But uh, I'm, I'm just excited when you know, uh, family members, friends, uh, you know, aren't asking all these questions, they're actually in there now, and users and part of adopting uh, Web3. Mm -hmm. So now I guess this is the turn where I have, I have to guess what yep. uh, Steve's gonna yes. talk about. Yeah. Uh, well, since I didn't take bridges, no. Yeah. <laughs> security, security. Yeah, pretty much, I feel like a better yeah. developer tooling. You know, we, we build a lot of it, but there's even some that we rely on, so th there's things like fuzzers, um, lots of different tools that make it easier and more accessible for, for the builders out there to get out and, and build other products securely. So I think there's, there's a lot of space left for that and it's, it's still in its infancy. Um, and so I, I really think uh, in general, we're gonna speed up if we can continue to focus on that. Mm -hmm. All right. And so then a lot of people here uh, are curious in like how to get into Web3 or how to be a founder of Web3. Maybe Steve, actually, from you, like how can they be the next Steve Ellis? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> That's a tough yeah. Um, patience is good. You got to, uh, but uh, perseverance and, and determination. I, but I, I consider it a lot of luck. Uh, and yeah. Um, Find the, the places where you think it's going to be really impactful and try to focus on that. Uh, the things people aren't doing yet. Because there's tons of opportunities popping up constantly. The space moves so quickly. So just look for, for sort of where there are new openings as these, as these new tools pop up. Yeah, I remember when I first joined Chainlink, uh, like four and a half, five years ago, I, I was like booting at these like uh, hackathons and no one knew what oracles were. They're like, why do you need oracles? I'm like, because of all this. And, and people didn't quite believe. And now years later, like we saw, you know, we had that head start and we started building and now all of a sudden it was like, oh my God, oracles are so critical, right? So, and you saw that even before everybody else. So Yeah, there was a long time where it was hard to even talk to people about it. Like people weren't even interested and it, it was, you know, could have died on the vine. I was, I was scared of that, but um, yeah, I'm glad yeah. I stuck with it. Perseverance. Woo! All right. yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah. Any other tips, Mike? Oh, you so have a gr you had a great article uh, on LinkedIn about how to get into Web three, right? And why you yeah. chose it. Yeah. So. Um, so the question is like, how do you get into the? Yeah, like everyone. For wants, those who aren't. How do they become you guys? Oh. Um, <laughs> Well, I think, um, well, maybe I'll ask a question for those who aren't yet formally in, have a, have a job or full-time in the industry. I think, um, and I'm speaking from like more of a non-technical background, I think the most important thing uh, that I found was just to get in there and experiment. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm surprised how many people I'll still interview and, uh, you know, uh, have you done a DeFi transaction? No. You know, have you bought an NFT? Have you minted an NFT? Um, so, I mean, those are like a starting place, pretty basic, but... Uh, you'd be surprised how many people uh, you know, are reaching out, wanting to get into the industry, and the first place, of course, to, to start is experimenting. I think the, the next thing, and maybe this is a little bit similar to Steve, is that you, you, know, you gotta have conviction um, uh, or a thesis, in my opinion. Uh, when people look for work, um, I find that, that on average, the average person's a bit reactive. Uh, it's like a couple searches or someone reached out to them. And instead, pick your thesis, right? So maybe you're not gonna start a if you're not gonna start a Web3 uh, business like Steve, but you wanna get into one, well, what, what are you passionate about? What do you have conviction that you think is an area that's gonna to drive it? So I was very targeted. You know, I had a very small set of uh, companies I was interested in and projects I was interested in and went directly at them versus just starting to you know, scatter uh, interest all over the place. Yeah. Well, let me have time for one last question, and I really want to know this. I, you guys are all brainiacs, so what is one book that you will gift to somebody? We'll start with you, Dahlia. One, not two. Just one, just one, and maybe why. All right, so I'm thinking of two, so I'm going to take a vote. <laughs> How many people here are interested in cooking? Raise your hands. Oh, a good 25%. <laughs> How many people are interested in uh, finance and macroeconomics? Uh, I think finance one. All right. One. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so I will go with uh, and the cookbook. Seek, you know, seek, 
seek me afterwards if you want some cookbooks okay. uh, recommendations. You're not allowing me to, okay. <laughs> Um, okay, maybe I'll give you two. I think anybody in the field that wants to understand how the system of uh, central banks have emerged uh, in response to the, you know, the large financial crisis of the last century and how they dealt with that financial crisis, which is not a great timing to talk about that, absolutely has to read uh, uh, Lord of Lords of Finance. Okay. Lords of Finance. Cool. And, and it's, it's, it's a fascinating book. It, it's it's uh, mesmerizing to read. Very cool. Come on. Um, so my book would probably be uh, 4,000 Weeks. Uh, I don't know if uh, anyone has read it. Um, but it actually, 4,000 Weeks is the average lifetime of a human. It would sound kind of crazy when you put it that way. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, and it's one of these, it's not one of these books like, oh, you don't have a lot, you don't have a lot of time. Uh, just just go, go do something crazy. It's more about like, Obviously, start with this premise, right? But it's like, how, what do you do once you know that? And, um, and and I think it's you know getting back to the notion of urgency. I think it's um, it, it's for me it was a, a really interesting book reflecting on what I wanted to do next, what I wanted to uh, spend uh, my time on, and 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 just picking something that was that I felt was meaningful. Um, and so I find it. I mean. I'm not going to do justice to the, uh, to the book, so I would encourage any one of you who's interested in that topic in reading it. That reminds me, thinking about my own life, I did edit a book, and I do get, I don't know, like uh, two bips of a cent uh, on every copy <laughs> that I read. So, it, you know. Do you want to plug your book? Can, 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 can I make a Yeah, plug? yeah, yeah, you can make a plug. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mike. So I, actually, I was going to use a different book, but real quick, um, I just finished a book called Lifespan, which actually is, is interesting. I guess, how many weeks did you just say the book was? 4,000. 4,000. 4, so this maybe would you know, double it. There's a lot of great research and science happening now to extend longevity. They're starting to be able to reverse aging in certain areas. So, so hopefully the, <laughs> his book will be updated. And double <laughs> for all of us in our lifetimes. Uh, but the book I was going to uh, recommend, I've sent out to people, is a book called Range. Mm. Um, and so what Range is about is um, generalists, uh, you know, and end up doing a lot of uh, the most uh, valuable things often in the world because they connect dots. They've seen, they've had different industries or different functions or different places they've lived. Mm -hmm. And I guess it speaks a little bit to how I've lived my life, which is you know, not this like straight line, following these passions that sometimes may seem zigzaggy, uh, doing what might be considered random things, but over time, I feel like it's really uh, created uh, a much more enjoyable life. And uh, so that's what his book argues. Um, it'll give the example of like, you know, a lot of people think like say Tiger Woods in golf, like you started it, what, three, four years, that's the way you're great at something. Um, the alternative is like uh, Federer, who like didn't pick up tennis till teenage years. He was a general athlete. So um, I just think it's uh, an insightful way to, to live your life and have a growth mindset and, uh, and explore a lot of different things, even if you don't know ultimately where you're going. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I was going to say Dahlia's book on the work of Leslie Lamport, but, uh, but what, if this, <laughs> since that's already been taken, I'll go <laughs> with... Uh, Wait, for everyone. No, please, please say it. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go with... Uh, I only the, have four... Th Thousand weeks to live, according okay, to that's true. Yeah. Please <laughs> buy the book. Eight thousand. Um, but the the there's a book called the Systems Bible that I really like. It's got kind of an intimidating name, but it's uh, it's non-technical. It's about building systems uh, like organizations, uh, technical systems, all kinds of systems, and it's sort of a philosophical, playful look at sort of the problems that come up in problem solving. Um, so it's a it's a good one. Very yeah, cool. And I'll add one final book that I uh, actually love. It's called How Do You Measure Your Life? Mm. Uh, it's a book by Clay Christensen, who was a, a business school professor. And he took economic uh, models and you know, applied them to life. So help, you know, how do you find a job that's you know, going to fulfill your passion? Or how do you measure what's important to you to have a fulfilling life? So um, that's one more to add to your list. And now you have a range of books. Well, with that, I just want to thank you, panelists and colleagues, for being here. And thank you, everyone, for being part of SmartCon.